Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutonFeather.com and in this fly tying tutorial I'll be tying a fly with you that I call Camisa's CDC Green Caddis. Stay tuned. Here is a sneak peek of the CDC Caddis Pupa. It's a little bit different than the original CDC Caddis Pupa that I tied on my YouTube channel, but this is definitely a modern one, a current one, one that I use that really gets down in a hurry, and it's got those great CDC fibers for legs that will really just move in the water. So with that said, let's get a clean hook in the vise and start tying this one. In my Sonfo Transformer vise, I have a Honic H450BL, that BL designation stands for barbless. I'm tying this in a size 14, though I'll tie and fish this anywhere between sizes 12 through 18, depending on what's in the water at that time. What I really like about the H450 hook is that it's a jig style hook, which means when you have it paired with the appropriate bead, it will typically ride hook point up, which means less snags and hopefully you lose less flies. I do have it paired with the right bead. This is a hazard fly fishing bead. It's a three millimeter slotted tungsten bead. What I really like about this is that the color is black nickel. With that color, I think you kind of get a twofer. It still has a little bit of shine to it, which I kind of look at that as a fish attracted at times. But then it's also a darker color, which could be representational of a caddis pupa or a caddis larva in regards to their head or their thorax. So kind of keep that in mind with your bead selection. The thread I'm going with is an ADOT unit thread color chartreuse. We're going to start that directly behind the bead. We'll get rid of the tag end. We're going to go right into our body material, which is from Hens, and it's called body quill material. You can see all the numbers there. I have no idea what they all mean. I think the BQ is body quill. At that point, I don't know, but I'm going to go with this color, which is an insect green to me. To apply this stuff, basically just Cut off a section of it. It's probably a little bit longer, but it will work for the purposes of this video. And I'll wrap it around my thread. So then on the side opposite from the camera, basically the side closest to me, I'll align there two tips. And I'm basically going to start by wrapping my thread and securing the body material going down the top of the shank of the hook. When I get down to about where the barb would be, I tend to make one or two more wraps back, and then I wrap back forward. When I get close to the eye, I'm going to just go back towards the middle and then wrap forward again just to create a very slight taper. I don't think it's uh, really critical that we have a taper built into this fly. I like to keep it slender just so I know it will get down to the bottom in a hurry. So at this point now, I'll just continue to keep these two pieces of body quill lined up. I'm going to wrap them forward together. So I basically want touching wraps. I look at this as a pretty secure material, so I, I have never really used um, any type of a ribbing with it, but if that's something you'd like to do, I, then you could counter rib it. Once we get close to the bead, we can tie it off. We just need two or three wraps. I'm gonna wrap once with this body cool now going towards the rear of the hook. What I've noticed is that sometimes whenever I cut this stuff away, it will just kind of break off and sometimes that extra piece will shoot frontwards. It'll go over the bead. I don't think the fish care at all. I'm just talking about from a fly time perspective to make it look a little better. And then next we're going to add our thorax material. This is going to be something from Jack's Tackle. I am not going to try to pronounce Jack's last name, but what I really like about this one is it's a black squirrel with antron and purple flash, so it's really easy to dub on. It's just got just a little bit of flash to it, which I think is definitely a positive. If you don't have this, just go with your favorite peacock blend you got, or you can even use peacock. I'm going to apply just a little bit on my thread. And once you have your dubbing noodle, we're going to try to make about three turns. So I'm just going to slide it down towards the body. There's one, two, and number three. And at number three, I'm just going to try to pull up some of the, that dubbing back towards the, the bobbin. 
And next, we're going to add some legs. Now, for our legs, I'm going to grab a piece of CDC, and I already have this one prepped. So this is a piece of CDC that I prepped. What I like about this piece of CDC is that it's got a, a decent stem, but the stem is also darker. So I don't want a really thick stem, but I want one that I know I can wrap around the hook, and I want one that's in a darker color because I want it to kind of blend in with everything I have going on. Now we're going to be using this to represent the legs. Don't think of this CDC as flotation. We're using this because once this CDC gets wet, it's going to have just some great movement in the water. Now if you've noticed what I, what I did to prep this, I held on to the tip and I just stroked the fibers down towards the base of the feather. And then to secure it in place, I'm going to grab it by the tip, transfer it to my left hand. So now I just have all those tip fibers shooting forward. I'm just going to lock those in place. Maybe. Let's try this again. In between the bead and the thorax. So I just need two or three wraps. Once I have that secure, I just want to trim those as close as possible. Next, I'm going to grab my Stonfo Elite hackle pliers. Uh, you know, I've used these in a ton of videos. I love these. Just going to grab onto the stem. And I want to make around two wraps. If you want to try palmering this stuff, you can, but at the end, I'm just going to make sure that whenever I wrap forward, I'm going to make sure all those legs are just kind of splaying back. So there's one and number two. At this point, just kind of, kind of lock all that stuff. There's one. There's two more wraps. As you can notice, I'm really not taking a lot of thread wraps. Now to cut this, I'm just going to really try my best to cut just the stem of that. And then next, I'm just going to pull all those fibers forward. If you look, I still have just a little bit of dubbing left. That's a perfect amount, so I'll slide it back down. Go about two wraps around, and at that point, I can go right to my whip finish. I'm just going to do a quick three turn. Make sure everything looks how I want it. It does. Those CDC legs are just kind of splaying away from the body. So next I can grab a little bit of head cement. In this case, I'm going to be using Sally Hansen Mega Shine. I am not using it because I want it to Mega Shine. This has just been the, the head cement that I've used recently. I'm just going to apply a little bit to the thread. Not a lot. I don't want, really want it getting anywhere near those CDC fibers. I may do the same thing as before, just three more. So a total of six. If you start to see the chartreuse thread, that is not a great concern. Once you have it there, I'm just going to try to get it again as close as possible. Trim away my thread. Maybe clean up some of the fibers from my, uh, from my thorax. And that is all we have to this pattern. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're taking a quick peek at mine, you can see some of that antron, some of that purple flash kind of splaying out. I would definitely leave that. The CDC may be a little bit long, so if I try to kind of fold it over, you'll see it definitely goes past the body. If that bugs you, you can do one of two things. You can simply splay it back, and then with one of your hands, just kind of pinch the fibers and pull them away. And what you'll notice is that they tend to, to maintain a pretty decent, um, we'll say, end. They're not going to be perfectly trimmed, but they're going to look fine. Or if you want to kind of go against the holy grail, you can cut them as well. On a video, I will definitely not cut the CDC fibers. I can tell you though, when I'm in a rush, I have no problem trimming the ends of them. They may not look perfect, but for some reason, the fish really don't seem to mind. So with that said, let me give you one more quick 360 of this pattern. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about it from a fly fishing perspective. So that's all there is to the CDC Green Caddis. Now before I, I kind of go into some other directions, I first want to mention that I'm calling this Camisa CDC Green Caddis simply because I haven't heard of anyone else tying this specific fly. But I am definitely not silly enough to believe that no one else out there has ever tied this one. So if you know of another name for this fly or you know of somebody else who's been tying it for more than three years, by all means let me know because I want to give that individual credit. 
Now with that said, let's talk a little bit about this fly because it's meant to imitate what we call in central Pennsylvania the granum caddis. They call that the Mother's Day caddis out west. And when I think about some of the streams that I fish and you're going along these moving waters and if you find a stick in the stream and you pick it up, sometimes you'll see these little, they almost look like rectangular prisms on them and we call those cased caddis. And if you pinch them and kind of pull off one side, you'll pull out this little green caddis. And that's what this fly is intended to imitate. Those tiny green caddis will eventually hatch. They'll turn into an adult caddis and it is a blast. But those fish really love to key on this style of fly earlier in the season. We're talking late March and mid-April. We'll say beginning to mid and sometimes the whole way through the month of April. So that's when I love to fish these. Now let's talk a little bit about the tying perspective of this fly and whenever I think about it, we're going to start with the body and I tied it with that hen's body material and it was really slender and I tied that with a specific purpose and that's because whenever I'm fly fishing with this pattern, I wanted to cut through the water and get to the bottom in a hurry because it's intended to ride directly on the bottom. By keeping it slender, it will definitely do that. So if you're into contact nymphing or check nymphing or tight line nymphing or whatever you're calling it right now, go with that. Now if you haven't got into those European styles of nymphing yet, can you still use jig hooks? Absolutely. There are so many people that ask me, is it okay if I use jig hooks whenever I'm doing conventional nymphing? And the answer is yes. If you have them paired with the appropriate slotted bead, they'll ride hook point up, which means less snags for you. So fish those jig hooks. You'll notice I use the Honic. I love that hook and I also love that it's barbless and I'll encourage you to use barbless hooks as well. As we move up into that fly, I talked about the dubbing. I basically said go with your favorite peacock dubbing and that's really the gist of it. But whenever I kind of take a step back, what I'm going for is that chartreuse body and I want that contrasting head. I run a really dark thorax or head just to almost get the fish's attention. And then most importantly, I'm going to go with those CDC fibers for the legs. Now whenever I think back to 15, 20 years ago, whenever I first started hearing about and utilizing CDC, we really thought about it as this dry fly material, almost this magic material. But then maybe around 10 or so years ago, I started just integrating it into my nymphs because a lot of my friends were. Because once it gets wet, that CDC, it will move and it will breathe. It will look almost like a soft hackle. So whenever you hear CDC, don't just automatically assume it's a dry fly because in this case, with that hazard fly fishing bead, this thing is meant to ride directly on the bottom and that CDC I want it moving and just looking alive in the water similar to a caddis and I really want it to capture the fish's attention. Now let's transition over to fly fishing. And when I think about fishing this pattern, I think I've talked about kind of all the biggies already. The time of year when I fish it and the March throughout the month of April, how I fish it, that contact nymphing style. I like to fish this fly in the riffles and as the riffles transition into a pool. Those seem to be two of the best places that I have luck with this fly, though when those fish are feeding on the green caddis, it seems like you can cast it anywhere and you're going to be picking up a bunch of fish. Go with it, look for some of those caddis in your local waterways and if they're there, have confidence and fish this fly. Well, with that said, thank you so much for watching this fly tying tutorial. If you'd like to watch more like it, you can check out my website, which is troutandfeather.com. Once you're there, if you scroll to the bottom of the homepage, you can sign up for my email list and I'll send out occasional updates regarding my fly tying videos, any fly tying appearances, or anything else that's newsworthy along the way. If you're into social media, you can find Trout and Feather on both Facebook and on Instagram. If you have any thoughts about this fly or any comments, I'd love to hear from you. You can leave them down below in the comments section or you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com. If you want to see the exact recipe for this fly, you can check it out in the description of this video. Well, once again, thank you everyone for watching this fly time tutorial on Camisa's CDC Green Caddis and I'll see all of you soon.